Hey folks, it's Andrew from Gemba Red, and today we'll be reviewing some articles about dosing red light therapy for brain health. As a disclaimer, this is not medical advice, it's just for educational purposes only for you to review with your doctor if you plan on using red light therapy for any medical conditions. So I wanted to get started with a recent article titled, Transcranial Photobiomodulation Increases Cognition and Serum BDNF Levels in Adults Over 50 Years, a Randomized Double-Blind placebo-controlled trial. So this article had 46 people that were treated and 46 people that were in the placebo group. They used an LED helmet with 850 nanometers near-infrared and 660 nanometers red light. There was a total of 204 LEDs with an equal split of red and near-infrared. However, the intensity for each wavelength was different. The near-infrared emitted 23 milliwatts per centimeter squared and the red emitted 10 milliwatts per centimeter squared. The hat was used for 20 minutes per session, resulting in a dose of near infrared of 27.6 joules per centimeter squared and red of 12 joules per centimeter squared. The device was in continuous mode, meaning it was not pulsed. There were three treatments per week for eight weeks for a total of 24 treatments. So I will comment that these are very simple, accessible parameters for a device and a protocol. They use the basic wavelengths of 850 and 660. They use low intensity, adequate exposure time, and no fancy pulsing. So let's look at some of their conclusions. You can see a picture of the helmet on the left. Our findings indicate that TPBM enhances cognitive function in adults and may play a preventative role in neurodegenerative diseases as its effects persisted three months after treatment completion. In another conclusion, they said to the best of their knowledge, this is the first randomized trial to analyze the effects of whole head TPBM using red and NIR LEDs over two months in adults with MCI. Our findings suggest that TPBM treatment enhances cognition and elevates BDNF levels in adults with MCI. So let's talk about their selection of wavelengths. Uh, we do know, you know, I've got some blog articles about how 850 is not necessarily the best near infrared wavelength, but definitely is an effective wavelength. And there's a lot of hype around 1060, 1050, 1072 nanometers of being this longer wavelength that penetrates deeper because it has less scattering. Uh, but again, you know, this study showed that 660 and 850 work just fine. So it's hard to speculate of what would be better or worse. And this is their comment about uh, why they selected the wavelength. They referenced a previous study that compared using a helmet at 1070 nanometers versus whole body PBM at 660 and 850 nanometers. And that previous study was treating brain fog from long COVID. But they felt that the combined wavelengths seemed to do slightly better. So that's why they chose the 660 and 850 that seemed to do slightly better than the 1070 alone. So in terms of pulsing, they decided not to do pulsing. They referenced the previous article that did show pulsing was more effective in healthy patients, but they thought maybe that wasn't relevant since they were treating MCI. Uh, so that's why they didn't choose pulsing. So the proper intensity for the brain, and you know, I'm all about getting the proper intensity and not too high intensity. Obviously you don't want it too low, everyone's gotten that memo, but too high is also problematic. So one of the big things is here's a recent uh, review article on photobiomodulation on the brain, and they separate out the laser intensity and the LED intensity. So let's look at the differences here. So they talk about a class four laser that requires active cooling or continuous motion, probably to reduce, you know, the heat effect and the heat buildup and the power density was around 700 milliwatts per centimeter squared but in the same sentence they say while leds have power densities between 10 and 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared so i see this as a big problem all the time a lot of influencers and brands are cherry picking laser studies to justify their falsely inflated intensity numbers and you know try to make this false narrative that higher intensities are better but they're choosing laser studies usually a laser is a tiny pinpoint so it might be okay to use a higher intensity because the power is actually technically pretty low whereas leds tend to be larger devices and cover 
more area, they tend to actually have more power, but less intensity because that power is spread over a larger area. So it's very important, you know, we're going to try to stick to LED relevant studies because that's more relevant to what the consumer has access to right now. Uh, you know, if you want a laser, then you can go get a laser and use high intensity. Uh, but we're focusing on, you know, LED devices mostly here. So I think it's irresponsible to promote high intensities from lasers and say, oh, you need to cover your whole body with uh, 700 milliwatts per centimeter squared because I cherry picked a laser study. Uh, you know, that's getting pretty uh, reckless in this industry today. Okay, a textbook on photobiomodulation in the brain. I think it was published 2019. Uh, here's a chapter on dosing for the brain. So that's pretty relevant. We'll be referencing it a couple times. And of course, higher intensity is not always better. It's ex explicitly written in many articles and textbooks like this one. And so let's see what they have to say. There is a speed limit to how fast an effective dose of PBM can be delivered. If it is delivered too quickly or too slowly, the desired effect may not occur, even if the fluence dose is correct. Studies have experimented with delivering a dose with a range of different irradiances, consistently find that lower irradiances are more effective when the same fluence is applied. So this dosing principle is super important. It's written into textbooks. It's written into peer reviewed articles. Uh, you know, not, not a lot of people are getting this memo because it contradicts the sales narrative of high intensity products. Uh, but again, you know, we're, we're trying to take care of our brains and, and our health. Uh, we don't want to miss out on really basic fundamental stuff that's included in these textbooks. So one recent article was a systematic review of light therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. And basically, you know, they look at a ton of different studies and try to come up with different conclusions and patterns that they see. So they found a pattern that the lower power density between 15 to 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared brought more treatment improvement than a higher power density between 40 to 90 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So again, you know, 40 to 90 might be effective, but they found it seemed to be more effective to use 15 to 30, which again was in line with that previous review article that said the range was 10 to 30. So this next slide, we have two more review articles that go into photobiomodulation for cognitive function and TBI. And so one of them found a trend that the irradiances were typically between 10 to 70 milliwatts per centimeter squared, but the most common one was 22.2 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So again, within that range, uh, 10 to 30 or 15 to 30, uh, the most common intensity was 22.2. So the one on the right here, they say the irradiance was 20 to 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So again, we're right in that ballpark, usually between 15 to 30, usually, you know, the mid to low twenties seems to be the sweet spot for a lot of these, these treatments. And they say the fluency, you know, the dose was one to 10 joules per centimeter squared. We'll, we'll cover that in another section. So we do have these four systematic reviews that are specifically looking more at LED intensities and not laser intensities that tend to be higher, but the LED intensities tend to be between 10 to 30, maybe up to 70 is okay, but they found that you get less beneficial results. It's not as optimal as being within the lower intensity range. Okay, so exposure time. So the true dose is the intensity and the exposure time. So, you know, that's that's the true dose that a lot of researchers will tell you and not to spend too much time looking at the joules per centimeter squared. So the textbook on photobiomodulation in the brain has a couple comments about uh, the proper exposure time. To be sure of replicating a successful treatment, ideally the same power, beam area, and time should be used. So again, you know, if you have a specific study, you want to replicate the study as much as possible. You don't want to assume, oh, I've got this high powered panel and I'm going to get better results than what a study got, you know, you're, you're kind of jumping to conclusions. Using more powerful devices as a way of reducing treatment time is not a reliable strategy. This might be news to a lot of people uh, uh, because uh, this, this memo has not been getting out, even though it's written into textbooks and, and many articles. Uh, you know, it seems to be uh, covered up for some reason. Okay, so they talk about irradiation time. So uh, we'll skip to PBM treatments for musculoskeletal pain are typically between 30 to 150 seconds. So if you're doing it for uh, musculoskeletal, you know, targeting muscles, targeting pains, uh, aches and pains and things like that, uh, athletic recovery and also... Um, you can use, you know, typically it's 30 to 150 seconds. Again, usually it's like with a skin contact laser. So it is a shorter treatment time, but 
Transcranial treatment times are typically in the range of four to 30 minutes, but we can start to see that the dosing is more looking at treatment times too, and not just looking at joules per centimeter squared. One of the systematic review articles also says uh, 20 minutes per LED platements was common in, in three of the studies that they reviewed. So 20 minutes seems to be pretty good uh, sweet spot. Again, you know, you want to have low intensity and get that, that nice 20 minute exposure time. So dose I put in quotes when we're referring to joules per centimeter squared because your dose again is your intensity, your exposure time, you know, how often you do it, all the parameters, not just boiling it down to one parameter joules per centimeter squared so a lot of people try to oversimplify and want you know to simplify everything down to one variable because they say variables are so variable which I've, I've in my whole engineering career i've never heard anyone say oh these variables are so variable <laughs> but okay so this article they had 27.6 joules per centimeter squared for the near infrared and 12 joules per centimeter squared for the red so you know that seems to be perfectly in line with two of the review articles uh both of them are saying one to 20 joules per centimeter squared is is a common dose for for brain health so i'd say start around 10 joules per centimeter squared you don't need to start on the upper end you know try to find your minimum effective dose uh, but again you're juggling your your variables you want to make sure you have adequate exposure time and low intensity Another review article goes into different doses for different types of neurological disorders. So again, you know, there's going to be a little bit of variability on, based on different types of neurological disorders. What's your severity of the disorder? You know, different uh, bio-individuality, male and female and skin type. Um, you know, all those can play a role. Um, so again, here's some, some good ranges to look at. So for neurological disorders, is between 10 and 30 joules per centimeter squared. For psychological disorders, it's between 12 and 84 joules per centimeter squared. For healthy subjects, it's between 15 and 60 joules per centimeter squared. So again, you know, very good range, you know, between 10 and 30, very similar to, to the intensity by coincidence, but between 10 and 30 joules per centimeter squared, that seems to be a good range to start out with. Again, starting at the lower end of the range, and if that if that works for you, then stay at the lower end of the range and you can always work your way up if you feel like you need more. But now we need to go into how often we do these doses because, you know, you could do a high dose once or twice a week or maybe you want to do a low dose multiple times a week. So the treatment frequency, and you know, and not talking about frequency in terms of pulsing, talking about frequency in terms of how often you're doing the doses. We've talked about in previous videos and blogs that there's a cumulative dose response. So doing doses too frequently, obviously if you do five doses a day, that's probably too much and you get that biphasic response where you start to inhibit cells. And the first study I started out with, that was three doses per week. So this review article is also saying for cognitive function with TBI, three times per week with a 48 hour break in between sessions. So sometimes when they specifically say that 48 hour break between sessions, that might be, you know, alluding to the, the, the knowledge of the cumulative dose response that you want to, you know, let some of those effects subside and then build it up again and then go back down uh, before, you know, doing too many doses. And the brain textbook also mentions uh, studies used one to three times per week. Uh, so that's very common. You can do it three times a week, you know, very low time commitment, just doing it three times a week. That's great. Uh, but they also say the, the effects of different time intervals between individual treatments to the brain have not been explored. So it means, you know, we haven't seen a lot of studies comparing three times versus five times versus seven times a week. We haven't seen those studies to truly optimize it, but we do know about three times a week does work. So, you know, again, it's hard to extrapolate and say is more frequent dosing better or worse. You know, we don't necessarily know. We don't want to extrapolate. We do know that three times per week is, is working very well for a lot of studies. So last I'll go over another review article I haven't uh, talked about yet is devices used for photobiomodulation of the brain, a comprehensive and systematic review. Um, so it's just got this nice diagram of different types of devices. And uh, I think it's very relevant to, you know, you want to think about, you know, not just having a specific wavelength or a specific intensity is how do you actually deliver the light and you know what's the best way to do it and transcranial PBM uh, you know again it just means you're treating through the skin and the scalp and the skull uh, you know to try to reach the brain so any device can be transcranial if you try to use it on your head then it's transcranial right so it's not like uh, in any kind of specific uh, fancy category 
so we see here you know with with the top left is, is you know basically just a laser device you can use you know that's probably historically the most common device they've used and then uh b you know they've got some led clusters on the head and then c is the helmet which is probably very convenient and you just kind of cover the whole head and you know you just sit there uh, D looks kind of like the V light system where they have a couple of specific diodes on the skull and they also have the intranasal E they have, uh, just the intranasal. So you could just get brain benefits just from intranasal F is basically an led cluster, you know, on the forehead. So, you know, I always say you can use light panels and devices, put it right on the forehead. Cause that's prime real estate. There's no hair to block the way, you know, you can get it straight into the skull. So, you know, a, a small handheld device that you can put on your forehead, uh, you know, can go a long way in terms of supporting cognitive health and g this looks like these are fiber optics inserted with you know needles uh so get closer to the brain so um you know if you really need that deeper penetration sometimes they can insert it with with a needle and a fiber optic to get in closer uh to the brain or into certain deeper tissues so so that's an option it's probably not an option you do at home uh but might be something uh that that's uh one technique to use and so you can see uh, there is one type of product that's uh, conspicuously missing from, from this chart, and that is a non-contact LED panel. Uh, so, you know, that's a, uh, that's a big reason why some influencers are selling non-contact LED panels. They'll tell you it's the best, and they'll make tons of medical claims. And then you ask them how to dose it, and they say, oh, we don't have any evidence-based dosing because, you know, they don't really study non-contact LED panels. And clinical studies, most of them, you know, you can see all these are, are placed right on the head. Uh, you know, so again, it's hard to assume and again, extrapolate, uh, can you use a non-contact device? Sure, probably. Um, but you know, it might be some considerations of skin reflection losses and if the company's false advertising intensity and, uh, you know, they're, they're making, they're making their panels too powerful anyway. So you have to turn down the intensity or move far away from it. Um, so there's a lot of factors. So, so again, you know, as, as one of the previous quotes said, we want to replicate, you know, if you want your best odds of getting a good result you want to replicate a study as close as possible you know and you don't want to uh, make a lot of substitutions you know if you have to it's fine there's a lot of flexibility uh but again you know if you make too many leaps you might not get the right results so that's it we got a lot of great data that came out this year that helps us conceptualize you know proper dosing for the brain and various uh, brain health and cognition um, so it's really empowering uh, information and you know we can see the parameters are very simple and very basic uh, you can get benefits with a wide range of wavelengths you know 660 810 830 850 1060 you know all those work fine usually a combination of at least one red and one near infrared seems to work very synergistic for activating you know systemic mechanisms and getting that deeper penetration you know in terms of intensity you know all you need is 10 to 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared that seems to be kind of a very good range for getting effective and making sure it's very safe you don't want to overdo your brain uh, so you know I think that's a very good range to start with usually in the mid to low 20s seems to be one of the sweet spots um, so you know get a reasonable intensity and don't try to overcook your brain uh, exposure time which again the intensity and exposure time are two of the primary factors for dose and exposure time it seems to be on average usually about 20 minutes um, seems like it could range from you know 4 to 30 minutes I'd say usually about 10 to 20 minutes is pretty good um, so again you know you, we've got a pretty good ballpark of, of range of parameters so it's very hard to mess up red light therapy dosing uh, so you know it's kind of impressive when brands and influencers do mess it up um, but you know we've got pretty big ranges to, to work with that that are safe and effective so try to get it a little bit closer to those ranges and then the treatment frequency how often you do it three times a week seems to work very well it's hard to assume you know if, if more or less W would work better or worse you know again that might be something to experiment with and see what works best for you uh, but starting with three times a week seems to be a good good choice and pulsing isn't required for for brain health even though that's you know been a very big push lately but again you know you get very good results with continuous wave uh, for various treatments um, but again if you want pulsing that's fine but uh you know it's, it's not always necessary i wouldn't want someone to not use red light therapy just because they need a certain pulsing 
And so that should sum it up. Hopefully uh, all that info helps and, and you can try to find, you know, appropriate products that are safe and effective if you know, are clinical grade. When clinical grade means it's with the right parameters and not the highest parameter that's going to cook your brain, you want the right parameter. So if people are talking about, oh, we make the highest intensity product, well, what does that mean? What, you know, what are you doing? So hopefully that helps. Uh, thanks for tuning in.